So, what are we? So this is a very basic philosophical question about us, what we're made of, our place in the universe. So what I'm going to do is to give you the physicist's answer to this question. So the physicist's answer is described in terms of a theory that we call the standard model. And this model is described by an equation, which I'm now going to write on the board, and I'll try to explain to you what are the roles played by the various pieces of this equation in answering this very fundamental question. So, like every equation, there's a left-hand side and a right-hand side. On the right-hand side, let me write down the first line in this, which is our description of the fundamental interactions. So what interactions do we know about? We know about electromagnetism. So electromagnetism was first written down in a unified way by Maxwell in the 1860s. And this piece of our equation describes Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, but also describes a lot more. It also describes uh, the strong nuclear interactions that hold nuclei together. It also describes the so-called weak interactions that are responsible for forms of radioactive decay. So all these interactions are here. Now, in addition to the fundamental interactions, the standard model also includes a description of the particles of matter that fill the universe. So some of these we're quite familiar with, uh, electrons, for example, which exist in clouds around nuclei. And inside those nuclei, there are particles called protons and neutrons. And inside those protons and neutrons, are things that we call quarks. So when we're thinking about the fundamental particles of matter, we think about electrons, quarks, and their various relatives. So what is the term in the equation that describes them? So this we write in the form I psi, this Greek symbol, represents an antimatter particle. This represents the way that one of these interactions works on one of these particles of matter. And there's the particle of matter there. So the, the origins of this, you can somehow trace back to uh, Einstein in 1905, when he described how Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, how that would act on electrons inside matter. According to Einstein's theory, a particle of light hits an electron inside an atom and knocks it out. And this is a basic form of interaction with matter, which is encoded inside the second line of this formula. Now, there's a problem at this point. We know that electrons have a mass. If they didn't have a mass, then they would always travel at the speed of light, and they would never stick around with nuclei to form atoms. So in order to form atoms, we need a mass for the electron. So how do we do that? So. This is the magic line of the fundamental equation which describes that.
So this psi, okay, we've met that before. That's a particle of matter. And what is H? You can probably guess what H is. This is the famous Higgs field. So Peter Higgs and others proposed in the 1960s that extending throughout all space, there is a, a universal, homogeneous, and isotropic field. So field, uh, what do we mean by that? Well, remember that we talk about electric fields, magnetic fields, gravitational fields. So those are the effects of electric charges and gravitational masses. They have sources like an electron or, or like the sun, and they're not the same throughout all space. They vary throughout all space. What Higgs and friends suggested is that there is this additional field which would be universal, homogeneous, isotopic throughout all space. And it's that field which gives masses to the fundamental fermions. So this is the key idea of Peter Higgs and friends to give masses to the elementary particles. So there's one more piece of this uh, equation that I would like to write down. And this is the piece that I think of in some sense as being the engine room of the whole theory. This is the piece of the equation which describes how the Higgs field acquires its value, its universal value throughout all space, the universal value that determines the masses for all the other particles. So what is this V of H? This V of H represents the amount of energy that's in the Higgs field as a function of its value. And we can represent it by a picture that looks like this. So the amount of energy V depends on the value of the Higgs. And like anybody else, the Higgs likes to relax into the lowest energy state, which means here. And when it has this value here, corresponding to the lowest energy state, then that is a value which, when you plug it into this formula here, gives you the masses of the electron and other elementary particles. So here you have it, the basic equation describing the standard model, a line which describes the fundamental interactions, a line which describes how those interactions work on the fundamental particles of matter, like electrons and quarks. Where do the masses of those particles come from? They come from the third line of this formula, and that is where Mr. Higgs comes in. And this is what I call the engine room of the Higgs. This is what generates this value of the Higgs field throughout all space, it gives masses to the elementary particles. So there it is. No, it, it doesn't look particularly simple. It doesn't look particularly elegant. And you know, we physicists certainly want to try to improve it. Uh, we would like to find a more unified picture. We would like to understand why particles have the masses that they do. Uh, we would like to unify all the interactions into a, an even simpler picture than what you have on this, uh, on this blackboard. But the standard model represents a fantastic amount of progress. There are, of course, some questions which still remain open. And you will notice that there is a corner of the blackboard here which has completely escaped the standard model description. And somewhere in there, we don't know how it's described, but somewhere in there, there is a theory of dark matter which lies beyond the standard model and remains to be discovered.